Okay, we'll get started in just a few seconds. Hope everyone is having a fabulous Monday. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us and thanks for your patience. So again, just to make sure everyone is in the right spot, this is our first annual Van Gogh Film Fest and we're gonna be streaming Lust for Life in a little bit. But before we do, we'll spend maybe about 40 minutes or so, give or take a few minutes talking about the film and kind of some uh, different aspects of it. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you'd like to, you can tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and if you have a favorite art-related film. If you're watching on Zoom, you can do that in the chat or the Q&A feature. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can do that in the comments section. It's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from, and then also, too, what kind of art and films people like. And if you're watching on Zoom, we don't have time in these programs, unfortunately, to do a Zoom demonstration, but just real quick, there's usually only two things that people want to know how to adjust. One is the sound. So everyone will be in listen only mode or muted. So if you start cheering uh, during the film or dancing or whatnot, don't worry, no one will be able to hear you or see you. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. We did a sound test earlier and everything seems to be working fine. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides that we're showing take up the full screen, you can look for something on your device called either view or view options, which is usually up at the top of the screen. And you can click off something called side by side mode. So be on the lookout for that. And then if you have any questions or comments throughout our program, either about Vincent Van Gogh or the weather or <laughs> the film or any, no, I'm just kidding about the weather. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to let us know. One of my favorite parts of these programs, hosting them, is actually hearing all the different um, perspectives and opinions of people that are tuning in. So thank you very much. And if you have any technical problems, you can also let us know that again, either in the chat or the Q&A feature in Zoom or in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. So if those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And so that's why we're bringing you this program today. And I will be your host. My name is Robert Kellerman, and I'm the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. And we're actually celebrating our six year anniversary. So that's pretty cool. We got started six years ago and we've been doing all different types of things since then. So thanks for supporting our organization. One of our most popular programs that we used to do back before COVID is at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., we would have a Van Gogh and Impressionism guided tour of the museum. And inevitably, during almost all of our tours, someone would either mention or ask about these different Van Gogh films, like, hey, have you seen these? Or what did you think about them? So I thought it'd be cool for today to go stream some of them. So that's the story behind that. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh was born on March 30th, 1853. So tomorrow on Tuesday is his 168th birthday. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you have a piece of cake for Vincent's sake so that you can celebrate that. And Vincent passed away on July 29th, 1890 at the age of 37. So our Van Gogh Film Fest, we're going to be streaming Lust for Life, starring Kirk Douglas. And again, we'll stream the whole movie in maybe about 30 minutes or so. Um, tomorrow, we're going to do At Eternity's Gate with William Defoe as Vincent Van Gogh. And on Wednesday, we're doing Loving Vincent, an animated feature. So hopefully you can come join us for one of those two programs. Our previous film history program was a few weeks ago, we did Renoir. So we had kind of a similar program where we talked about the film um, in the context of it, and then we streamed it. If you want to watch the actual film, you can find it on a lot of different places like YouTube or Amazon and stuff like that. 
If you want to watch the introductory historical presentation that we did on the film, it's on our YouTube page, and our YouTube page is Washington, D.C. History and Culture, and we're actually also recording this program, so if you have to jump off at some point in time or you want to come back and listen to it again, you are free to do so, and again, you can find us on YouTube under Washington DC History and Culture. I think we have like 40 some historical programs that we've recorded for the past few months saved on there. So you can check that out. And what's our next film history program gonna be after Van Gogh? I'm hoping it's gonna be Frida, which is one of my favorite movies. So we have to um, work out some of the technical details on this film. So we don't have a date for this. I'm hoping that it's gonna be sometime in kind of late April. Um, so we don't have a date for this. We're not 100% sure we're gonna do it, but we think this will be our next one. And when you get a date for that, I'll be happy to send out the announcement for that. And what's the purpose of these film history programs or what are we trying to accomplish? And I kind of consider this to be kind of four different types of things. One is first we want to watch or view great films, including ones either we haven't seen before or perhaps haven't seen in a long time. And I would say that this film definitely falls in that category. Uh, number two, we want to study history and popular culture uh, through films. And so we hopefully going to learn something from watching this film. And then number three, we want to learn about the historical context of the film, its creators, and the subjects portrayed, in this case, Vincent Van Gogh. And then last but not least, want to discover any additional historical resources like films, music, books, museums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to be talking about Lust for Life, a really excellent film that um, quite a few people, in my opinion, have seen, um, but a lot of them have seen it, saw it, you know, like, I don't know, 20 years ago on cable or something, or they haven't seen it at all. Um, so it's a good opportunity for us to check this film out. Now, what's my overall opinion of the film? I'll be happy to share that with you. So you are more than welcome to 100% agree with me or 100% disagree with me. Take your pick as the film goes through. Feel free to, again, share your comments with us. Always interesting to hear people's perspectives. So overall, uh, the things that I like about Lust for Life is, number one, it provides a broad overview of Vincent Van Gogh's life. So that's a good thing. Uh, number two, it gives insight into Vincent's early painting career before he moved to France. So Vincent uh, Van Gogh, most of the well-known paintings he made were done while he was living in France. He spent the past, the last four and a half years of his life living in France and almost all things related to Vincent Van Gogh, whether they're films or articles or documentaries or museum exhibits, almost everything focuses on that last four and a half years of his life. But this film actually is the last 11 and a half years of his life. So it covers the seven years before he moves to France. And I liked that aspect of it because he's involved in a lot of interesting things that people um, probably aren't that familiar with. So I like that. Uh, and then number three, it has very uh, 1950s-esque dramatic acting performances. And you'll, <laughs> if you didn't see the um, trailer earlier, you'll see what I mean when we actually start streaming uh, the film in a little bit. So that's the scoop on that. Some of the things that um, I wasn't as excited about, uh, number one, is I wish the film gave a little bit more time to the four and a half years he spent in France. I liked the fact that they covered a lot of the pre-France stuff, but it's like about 50% of the movie. So it's kind of like 50% before he moves to France, 50% after he moves to France. And I kind of wish maybe it was like, I don't know, 25 or 30% before France and then the rest um, France. So good that they covered the pre-France stuff, but I thought maybe it could have been a little bit shorter. So to give them time to um, go over more of the French stuff. And then I saw, I thought there was a little bit too much emphasis on kind of his mental health situation, which obviously that's a important part for any particular person, especially Vincent Van Gogh. But I thought the film like focused a little bit too much on that. And I wish they would have focused a little bit more on his kind of showing you what kind of a, he was very intellectual um, and go into kind of more of the stuff and how he actually created the artwork. But overall, uh, I recommend this film, which is why we're streaming it. So again, as we go through our program, would love to hear what your thoughts and opinions are of the film, either good or bad or indifferent. So you can keep that in mind. 
And let's talk about the film. So again, this is like a historical context of kind of, uh, you know, is the film uh, accurate and some of the things that they go over, did that actually happen? And, you know, what's some stuff that you should look for and kind of things like that. So let's go through that. The film Lust for Life was based on a novel that was written by author Irving Stone, and it was first published in 1934. Here is a picture of the novel when it first came out. And then a little bit later version that came out after the film uh, was issued. And interestingly enough, Irvin Stone was only 31 years old when this landmark book was published. It was really the first um, extensive work done on the life of Vincent Van Gogh. There had been some other things published before that, but this was kind of like the, the new benchmark, so to speak, in terms of things on his life. Um, and again, it came out when he was 31 years old. And it was largely based on the Van Gogh letters. So Vincent and his brother Theo exchanged letters back and forth throughout their adulthood. And a lot of the book was based on letters that Vincent wrote to Theo that Theo ended up saving. Uh, Mr. Stone also did extensive research um, as far as his um, development of the film. And then he kind of filled in some of the gaps with just miscellaneous things. And if you want to check out this book, it's available on a lot of different websites, but this is the Amazon screenshot of it. And you can see it has a four and a half star rating. Um, so it's very highly regarded in terms of the audience on Amazon. And if you were to look on similar book selling websites um, that I checked out, uh, it's pretty much consistent across the board. So pretty highly regarded book, both in terms of the public and then also like historians and critics like that. And the director of the film is Vincent Minnelli. You may have recognized either his full name or perhaps his last name. Um, and he had made several other films. He had a very long, extensive career, kind of in the golden era of Hollywood. Um, some of the other films that he did before Lust for Life was Meet Me in St. Louis, and then An American in Paris, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he is the film director of Lust for Life. And again, very prolific uh, film director. He was married to actress Judy Garland in 1945, and they had a daughter, Liza Minnelli. So if you've heard of Liza Minnelli, her dad directed Lust for Life. So that's a pretty cool connection. Here's some of the films in that. And for the most part, the film was shot on location in Europe. So that was a nice touch. Now let's talk about the Detroit Institute of Arts self-portrait of Vincent Van Gogh. This one particular painting uh, is very important in the overall grand scheme of things. So Vincent Van Gogh made 36 self-portraits during his lifetime. And the one that we're gonna be talking about is surrounded by the red box. And why is that important? Well, because uh, a few different reasons. Number one is first of all, this was the first painting that was ever bought that Vincent Van Gogh created by an American art museum. Uh, and it was done in 1922. So Vincent died in 1890. And if you're under the impression that uh, right after he dies, he instantly becomes famous, that's actually not the case at all. Vincent's uh, only sold one painting during his lifetime. And while he's super popular now, that process or that transition took several decades. It wasn't like an overnight thing. And so just kind of as a historical footnote to give you an example of how that would have worked, say, in the United States, uh, Vincent dies in 1890. It's 32 years before an American art museum gets around to buying one of his paintings. Now, individuals had bought his paintings in the U.S. and galleries and stuff, but as far as a museum, him, uh, that didn't happen. Now, there had been paintings of his acquired by different um, museums in Europe, but as far as the United States go, that's the milestone date for that. And the reason why this painting is important is because it really served as the basis for the whole look of the film. Um, and so you can see this advertisement with Kirk Douglas on the right, and he looks very similar to the painting. So this painting at the Detroit Institute of Arts really kind of served as the kind of inspiration, so to speak, of how certain um, segments of the film ended up looking. Here's Kirk Douglas in character. Here's another picture of him with the painting. 
And if you want to learn more about Vincent van Gogh and how he ended up becoming so popular in America, they're going to have this really cool exhibit at the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's not going to open until October of next year. Hopefully by then, COVID's gone away or under control or whatnot. Um, so that's a really interesting exhibit. It's basically going to focus on how did Vincent van Gogh end up becoming so popular in the United States? And it's going to be centered around this painting. So I thought I would give a shout out to the Detroit Institute of Arts, which is, by the way, my former employer of many years ago. And if you're in Washington, D.C., they also have a famous Van Gogh painting at the National Gallery of Art. It's featured on the left. And in, throughout the film, they have recreations of a lot of Van Gogh paintings, um, some of them um, completed, some incomplete, some look more like the actual paintings and some less. So, so the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., their self-portrait uh, makes a cameo appearance um, at one scene in the film. So if you're a D.C. person and you've seen this famous self-portrait at the National Gallery of Art, or even if you're not in D.C., you've just seen it on your travels, uh, you can be on the lookout for it. It's, it makes a brief appearance in the film. Uh, let's talk about Walter Plunkett. He probably is not a household name uh, as much anymore, but a very important figure from the Hollywood golden era and also in the Lust for Life film. So he was the costume designer. So he was tasked with basically uh, making the film have the look and feel that it did, in particular the clothing uh, and accessories that are put together. So obviously he plays a very important role. And so here's Kirk Douglas in two uh, costume designs set up for to give off the appearance of Vincent Van Gogh. And again, looks very similar to the DIA self-portrait. And here are a couple pictures of Mr. Plunkett. And again, he's probably the most well-known or highly regarded costume designer of the Hollywood golden era. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me just go through a couple films that he was responsible for. Uh, first of all, he did all the costumes for Gone with the Wind. So 17 years before Lust for Life in 1939, he was involved in this film. And one of the things that Gone uh, with the Wind is known for is the really elaborate costumes. And so Mr. Plunkett took care of that. And then a little bit later in 1952, four years before Lust for Life, one of his other well-known films was Singing in the Rain, uh, which has kind of like a 1920s uh, setting to it. So he worked on numerous other films, just kind of give you a couple examples of two of his more well-known ones. But a lot of films from the Hollywood golden era, if they have really cool clothes in them, uh, there's a good chance that he was the guy in charge of all that, putting that together. So as far as lust for life goes, the things that you can look for is scenes where clothing and costumes or fashion accessories help portray a character like say Vincent Van Gogh, set the mood or tell the story to a certain degree. And what do I mean by that? Here's a picture of Vincent in the film with his sister. And notice how she's dressed really nicely and Vincent's in more kind of casual attire. And they actually talk about his clothing during this scene. Here's a scene with him on the left and Paul Gogan on the right is Anthony Quinn's character. And I would say in this particular scene, they're looking very bohemian. And then in this scene, that's Vincent or Kirk Douglas on the left and he's at his brother Theo's house. And this is an interesting scene because Vincent's dressed very casually, yet his brother and his brother's wife, or Vincent's um, sister-in-law, uh, they're dressed more well-to-do, like upper middle class. And you can see the, the kind of financial disparity um, between the two Van Gogh brothers, partially portrayed by the clothing. So again, the fashion is really interesting. It kind of helps uh, tell the story or set the scene, so to speak. So you can be on the lookout for that throughout the film. Let's talk about Kirk Douglas, the late great Kirk Douglas, he actually just passed away last year in 2020 at the age of 103, which is really amazing because if you consider <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh died when he was only 37, um, Kirk Douglas like almost lived three times longer than Vincent Van Gogh. Um, so really amazing in that regard. He was in a huge number of well-known successful films. Probably the most well-known role that he was in was as Spartacus. Um, if you're familiar with that film, it came out in 1960 or four years after Lust for Life. Uh, Kirk Douglas received an Academy Award nomination for Lust for Life and his portrayal of Vincent Van Gogh is widely considered one of the strengths of the movie, his performance. 
And then just uh, as an FYI, you probably heard of his son, Michael Douglas, who was born in 1944. And here's some clips for Spartacus. Oh, <laughs> so, so, some, uh, Jennifer just said we should do a film uh, program on Spartacus. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, I have to research that one a little bit, but Spartacus is a pretty cool movie. Um, and again, so Kirk Douglas, the starring role, and there's a couple things going on here. They, The film creators thought that he would be a good fit for this role because first of all, he's a great actor. Uh, and number two, he kind of sort of looks like Vincent Van Gogh. And then from his perspective, he was really interested in the role as well um, because he thought Vincent Van Gogh, the person, uh, was just a really fascinating individual. So you have kind of a perfect mesh of the people making the film and the actor coming together and they both are interested in collaborating with one another. And here's some scenes of him doing his thing. And you'll see these in the film. If you're familiar with Van Gogh's art, you might recognize that bridge in the background. He painted that scene a few different times. Let's talk about Vincent's um, early career. So again, one of the things I like about the film is it does explore the early years of Vincent's life, which um, is not really all that well known, um, unless you're a Van Gogh expert, because usually they just gloss over that stuff and just cut right to the chase and only talk about the last four and a half years of his life in France. If you think about Vincent's artwork, with the exception of the potato eaters painting, Almost all of the well-known Van Gogh paintings are in the France period, the last four and a half years. So I understand why people would focus on that um, because that's where he makes most of his well-known works, including these six examples. And just a quick geography lesson, Vincent again lived in France at this point in time um, from the spring of 1886 until when he dies in the summer of 1890. But the Lust for Life film focuses on the last 11 and a half years of his life. So they include basically the seven years before he ended up going to France. And what were some of the things that he was involved with? Well, you might not know that Vincent van Gogh was actually a pastor and a missionary in Belgium in 1879. So this is uh, before he decided to become a pastor, his father was a man of God, and he thought maybe perhaps he could follow in his footsteps. So that's actually a picture of Vincent van Gogh's father on the left. Perhaps maybe you see a little bit of a resemblance. And then Vincent ended up painting the church uh, that his father led, and that's a picture on the right. So Vincent decides that, you know, maybe this would be, this is what his dad does. Maybe this would be a good profession for him. In his early 20s, he's trying to find himself. Uh, he tried to be a school teacher. Uh, he worked at a bookstore. He worked in art galleries. And eventually he thought, well, maybe um, I should try this profession. And he does. And they cover that in the film, but it does not work out for him. He worked in this capacity, basically as a uh, missionary, he was sent off to Belgium, which is next door to the Netherlands, where uh, Van Gogh is from, and he <laughs> he puts his heart and soul into it in true Vincent Van Gogh form, um, but he clashes with the people that were the church leadership uh, organization, which Vincent frequently throughout his life clashes with people in kind of authority positions, whether it was his father or the people that led the church or um, landlords or <laughs> people in the art community. And they kind of talk about that. So when you see them playing in the film, that's something that people would usually ask in the tours, like, was he really a priest? Yeah, actually, he was for a few months. Um, he did actually try that profession. So, and interestingly enough, this is the exact point in time where he starts getting serious about creating artwork. And so he was uh, working and living in a coal mining area. And so he did this drawing of some coal miners. And then this is actually the first painting that Vincent van Gogh made. It's a watercolor and it's the coal mine area. So this, this time where he's doing this work is really important in his life. It's when he kind of starts the whole artistic process. Now he's not devoting his full-time attention to artwork, um, but he is starting the process, so to speak. Now there's a few different characters that come into the film uh, that have interesting relationships with Vincent. And you might be watching the film thinking, you know, are these real people? Did these uh, things actually happen? And so, yes, for the most part, they did. It's The film overall is pretty historically accurate. Um, you could probably nitpick some of the things. Um, for myself, I tend to judge a historical film on whether or not it kind of captures the overall essence of the person or the event. And I feel like this film does 
there's a character called K, and that's actually Vincent Van Gogh's cousin that he falls in love with. So when you see the character K, um, you can remember that's Vincent Van Gogh's cousin. This is around the time he's getting more serious about his artwork. You'll see that in the film. Here's uh, some drawings and paintings that he made just to give you kind of a sense of where he was artistically. One reason why this time frame is not as well known is this artwork is um, interesting. It's just not quite as popular with the general public as like Starry Night or things like that. Uh, this is actually the first oil painting that Vincent made. It was called Still Life with Cabbage and Clogs. Not one of his most well-known works, but it is still his first oil painting nonetheless. So interesting to look at that. And let me read this to you. So in August 1881, Vincent's recently widowed cousin, Key, daughter of his mother's older sister, arrived at his family's home for a visit. She has an eight-year-old son. So um, she had just lost her husband several months before, and she's Vincent's first cousin. She's the daughter of Vincent's mom's um, older sister. And she shows up on the scene and you see this in the film. Vincent was thrilled and took long walks with her. He surprised everyone by declaring his love to her and proposing marriage. She refused with the words, no, nay, never. Uh, and so that's kind of a famous um, Van Gogh life quote. And so he um, really falls head over heels in love with her. Vincent's the kind of guy that uh, jumps in with both feet uh, first and gives everything 100%. And she just wasn't ready for a relationship. Um, and she also had some concerns because they were related and that he was not, he didn't have a job, basically. He was creating artwork, um, but his family was supporting him. And she was like, well, how am I going to get married to you? You don't even have any money um, coming in. And he was like, well, we'll make it work. But what really upset his family was after she told him no, nay, never, he didn't accept that response. He kept pursuing her and trying to win her over, which really uh, annoyed the heck out of her and really troubled her family and also his family. So it led to a lot of arguments. Um, you can see undeterred, he nevertheless continues to press his intentions despite the increasing dismay and disapproval of both her and their families. The humiliating effort to win Key over severely rocked his religious faith. On Christmas day that year, he refused to attend church, provoking a violent quarrel with his father, a pastor, which resulted in him leaving home the very same day. So Vincent Van Gogh was never married. And as far as we know, don't have any children. He did propose marriage to this young lady though. And so you actually see her in the film. So uh, when you see his cousin showing up and you think, oh, wow, that's really dramatic. That's actually happened. <laughs> so uh, it's not too much Hollywoodized. And then there's a famous scene where he puts his hand in a candle uh, and he basically is pleading with his cousin's father, uh, basically to let him, Vincent, talk to her, to Key, um, but they do not let her do that. He basically says, let me talk to her uh, for as long as I can keep my hand in this candle. And it's a really dramatic scene. And again, you might think that's kind of like a Hollywood made up thing, but it's actually a true story. Vincent actually talked about this event happening in a letter that he wrote to his brother. So that's not like a, sometimes in movies, like especially historical movies, the best parts are the stuff that like didn't even actually happen they just included in there but some of the film's uh, best parts here actually did really take place including this scene uh, one of the things that's interesting is the marketing efforts of the film really kind of highlighted the love angle so like here's one image and then here's another one. So if you were to look at this film or this um, marketing stuff and not really know much about the film, you would think like this is a big love story. And that does play a part in it, but it's not like the main focus of the film. So interesting that the you got to watch out for those marketing people, which I'm an ex-marketing person myself. So um, then there's another young lady in the film named Christine, who's played very well by the actress Pamela Brown, and it was actually the girlfriend of Vincent Van Gogh. Her name was Sen, and this is her story. So Sen Harnock uh, lived with Van Gogh during much of the time in The Hague from 1881 to 1883, so about a year and a half. Van Gogh used Sen as a model for his work and later took Sen and her daughter into his home. Their relationship was not accepted by his family. Uh, Van Gogh left in 1883. I'll let you read the rest of that. So basically what happens is he meets this young lady. Um, they end up living together. She has one child already, and then she has another one on the way uh, in real life. In the film, they only show her with the one. 
And this is really um, Vincent's like longest or, or really only like long-term romantic relationship. Um, again, he's with her for about a year and a half. There's a lot of, um, I would say love in their relationship, but then there's also a lot of stress because he's really struggling financially as is she or her. Um, and so the kind of two of them <laughs> combined together uh, was maybe a little bit better, but there still caused a lot of friction between the two of them. But this is really the only long-term romantic relationship that Vincent had during his lifetime, unfortunately. There, were, um, there was another woman in Paris that he had a relationship with for just a few weeks, but this is really the only one. And it would be interesting if you could meet Vincent um, to ask him, like, who was the love of his life? Did he have someone that he felt uh, was that person? Maybe he would say, no, I don't have a love of my life. Or maybe he would say this um, woman was, or maybe he would say his cousin was. I don't know. It'd be an interesting question to uh, ask him. Um, and eventually they end up splitting up and they go their separate ways. And interestingly enough, or tragically enough, she actually died from suicide. Um, she threw herself into a river. And most people think that Vincent Van Gogh um, killed himself by suicide as well. So interesting that they both uh, potentially died from the same way. Here's some pictures of her in the film, so you can be on the lookout for that. So again, when you see this love story um, and they're living together, I think a lot of people probably don't realize that he was in this kind of relationship with someone um, because that kind of gets swept under the rug, so to speak, in most of the Vincent Van Gogh like life stories, so to speak, unless you're um, studying him in pretty great deal. There's the child she had. And then when they're together, he actually does a lot of depictions of her artistically, both sketches and drawings and things like that. So here's some of the artwork that he made at the time. So obviously you can see a very important person in his lifetime because he ends up depicting her so often. He, she's the woman that he ends up doing more artistic depictions of than anybody else in his whole life. There were many other women that he ended up doing like paintings and drawings of mostly people that he was not involved with romantically, but usually those were just more of like a one or two off thing. This is probably the most well-known image of her. She looks kind of down and depressed at this particular point in time. Notice the pictures, um, you don't really see her like smiling or laughing or anything like that. But then again, people were much more serious um, in the 1800s when they posed for portraits. You don't really see a lot of images of people like laughing and carrying on and stuff. So anyway, that's the images of her. And these are just some, there's actually quite a few other ones that he made. But again, this is a real person in the film, this different name. So kind of some things to look for in the film is what impact do you think uh, Vincent's relationships with Key and Sen had on the rest of his life. So something kind of to take a consideration of. Let's talk about Vincent's later years. So um, they have <laughs> some of his well-known paintings uh, included in the film. So this is his famous bedroom scene, which is recreated for the film. Here's his famous night cafe. This is outside. They have the night cafe scenes. And then this is his famous painting, the inside of the night cafe. And they've recreated that. So if you know a little bit about Vincent's life and are familiar with some of his artwork, you'll recognize some of the scenes that they created. So that's pretty cool. Let's talk about Paul Gauguin, who was played by Anthony Quinn. And um, Vincent's kind of situation with him takes place in 1888, so about a year and a half before Vincent dies, and there is Paul Gauguin, that's a portrait uh, that Paul made of himself that's at the Detroit Institute of Arts, as is the Van Gogh one that we showed you earlier. And here's a scene of them, and again, Paul is played by Anthony Quinn. And he did an excellent job as well. The, the character acting by Vincent um, and, or of Vincent and Paul by Kirk and Anthony, and then all the other actors really, um, again, one of the strengths of the film. Here's a portrait of Paul. And when, let me go back a minute, when Paul and Vincent are living together briefly or when they're spending time, you know, as friends, 
Um, neither one of them is a well-known artist. They're both starving artists that are broke <laughs> um, and trying to find their way. Um, so it's interesting that these two guys that would later become these super hugely famous artists, um, at this point in time in the film, neither one of them is well-known, and yet they would um, collaborate briefly, then they would have this kind of violent um, fight, and then they go their separate ways, and they both um, go take separate paths, but they both end up becoming uh, world famous. So really interesting that they were hanging out together at this time. But if you've heard of Paul Gauguin, uh, these are some of the paintings that he made. This is a self-portrait that's really famous. He's known for doing these works um, based on subjects in Tahiti. And for the most part, all of these types of paintings that he became famous for were done after he is in the film with Vincent Van Gogh. So like these would have been made several years later. And this is kind of what, his, what he's known for is making paintings that look like this. And again, he would become famous himself but that's a little bit later on. Um, but in the film, him and Vincent are hanging out with one another. There's the night cafe in the background. And here it is again, they're chatting about stuff. Now, this is interesting. This is a portrait that Vincent made of Paul on the left. And then on the right is a portrait that Paul made of Vincent. So Vincent's portrait of Paul is on the left. Paul's portrait of Vincent is on the right, and they're made around the same time. There you go. So some people are asking about the pronunciation. So I'm American, and I pronounce Van Gogh's name in the American pronunciation, Van Gogh. Um, the European pronunciation is Van Gogh. But if you get hung up on how the things are <laughs> pronounced, um, I don't know what to tell you. Either pronunciation is acceptable, um, just FYI. Um, let's see, this is a painting that Van Gogh did of Paul that's at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And his portrait that Paul made of him is also at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And eventually, they, they, the, Paul and Vincent had a lot of issues between the two of them. You might think that they had a lot in common because they were both artists, which they did to a certain degree, but they had very different philosophies on life and art, and they're also under a lot of stress because of the financial strain that they're in. Uh, they're living in very closed quarters. The space that they were living in is much was much smaller than it was depicted in the film. So they're basically on top of one another. Um, and then also, too, um, they both kind of very strong willed. Um, Paul wanted to be the um, kind of the alpha male of the relationship, so to speak, um, even though it was a platonic relationship. And Vincent really considered him and Paul kind of more equals. And Paul kind of considered him the, you know, the big kahuna, so to speak. And so um, that also causes some friction. So eventually they start arguing, quarreling, and fighting. And Vincent talks about that in a letter that he wrote to his brother Theo. So when you see all this dramatization taking place in the film, that's not made up. That actually happened. Here's a quote from a letter that Vincent wrote to his brother Theo. He says, Gogon has become rather disheartened with the good town of Arles, with the little yellow house we work, and especially with me. So kind of a sign of things to come. And eventually... Paul gets fed up with Vincent and this living down in the south of France um, and basically tells him that he's had it, he's through, and he's moving back to Paris. Uh, and this is really heartbreaking for Vincent because he was really lonely. This ear incident and this fight with Paul takes place down in the south of France. When Vincent moved there, he didn't know anyone there. He didn't have any friends there, or any family. So he's really lonely. And when Paul shows up, um, they're, you know, they're good friends and they're, you know, living together and whatnot, and he's someone he can talk to about art. And so, but then when Paul tells him he's fed up with him and he's leaving, this really like crushes Vincent. Um, and so he ends up having the ear uh, incident, which you'll see that take place in the film. Uh, the, the ear situation, for the most part, pretty accurately portrayed. Um, they get in this argument. Um, Vincent stated that he blacked out and didn't remember afterwards what happened this evening. Paul's side of the story was they got in this argument and Vincent approached him with a knife and Paul took off. And when he came back later, uh, Vincent was injured and the police were there and you know, it was a big bloody mess. So for the most part, it gets that part of the story pretty accurate. 
Um, and again, Paul and Vincent pretty closely connected. It's interesting when you go to an art museum, they frequently have Paul and Vincent's works uh, close to one another. Like for instance, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC, you go into this one room, uh, this big room in the Impressionism Gallery and the Vincent paintings are on one wall. And then on the exact opposite wall is Paul's painting. So interesting that they usually, usually not always, but usually museums put their two works uh, close together because they did have this close kind of a friendship, to, at least for a little while. And guess what? Anthony Quinn would end up winning the Academy Award for his role uh, in the film. So Kirk Douglas got nominated for his performance, but he didn't win. But Anthony Quinn did win the Academy Award. And if you get a chance, um, I'll post it later in the in the comment section, um, the Anthony Quinn acceptance speech, he was really humbled um, by the fact that he won the award. So I thought that was really touching. I'll post that a little bit later and you can check that out. And guess what? Did you know that Anthony Quinn later in life was actually a really serious artist himself? <laughs> and so this is him in his studio. And look at all this cool artwork that he's made. Um, so it's really neat that uh, he was interested in art from a very young age and later on in life as he had kind of more uh, free time, he kind of spent a lot more of his efforts creating art. So you have an artist to a certain degree portraying an artist, so that's pretty neat. Um, so some things to look for in Lust for Life would kind of be, how do you think um, Vincent and Paul would think of their portrayal? Do you, as you're watching the film, you should kind of think, gee, would, would um, Paul and Vincent be happy or content with how they were portrayed in the film? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Let's talk about Vincent's brother, Theo. Um, he was played by the fine British actor, James Donald. And Theo Van Gogh was three years younger than Vincent. He was an art dealer, meaning he managed an art gallery in Paris. And for the most of Vincent's career as a painter, um, Theo is a single guy and he's doing pretty well financially. He's not a millionaire, but he's pretty um, successful, so to speak. And so he has extra disposable income. And so he's the one who supports Vincent financially during his artistic endeavor. So um, the good news was for Vincent that Theo could send him money on a regular basis. So that's the good news. The bad news is he couldn't send him a lot of money. And it was really the only way he had money coming in, Vincent did, was from his brother. And so he has to live very frugally. And you'll get a sense of that during the film. So I just want to make sure you, um, people frequently ask, you know, how is Van Gogh able to support himself as an artist if he only sold the one painting? Well, he received support from his brother, um, Theo. But it was, a, it was a very generous amount. But he still had to live very, very frugally. But if you like the fact, if you like Vincent's art, you really got to thank his brother, Theo, because the financial assistance that he gave Vincent Vincent for all these years allowed him to focus 100% uh, of his attention the last several years of his life um, on being an artist. And in the film, he's played by the excellent actor James Donald, who um, you might recognize him or remember him if you've seen the movie The Bridge Over the River Kwai, um, although he looked a little bit different in that film, he was clean shaven. So all the actors and actresses that are in the film, in my opinion, did a really great job, including him. Let's talk about Vincent's death. We're getting close to the end of our program. Uh, this is one of the last paintings that Vincent Van Gogh made. It's called Wheatfield with Crows. And some people think it's the last painting that Vincent made, although there's some other people that think that no, it's not uh, the last one that he made. So suffice to say, if it's not the last painting he completed, it's one of the last ones. And I wanted to talk about it because they feature it in the film. And so there's a scene towards the end of Vincent's life, towards the end of the film, where he's basically creating this painting. He's out in the wheat field. He's trying to um, get the scene documented and the crows are kind of buzzing around him and getting on his nerves and agitating him. Uh, and then he ends up kind of having another breakdown. This is while he's painting the work. And so if you see this painting, um, that's a really important Van Gogh painting. This is one of the most important paintings that he made during his lifetime. And so you actually see it uh, recreate a film. That's not the actual painting <laughs> there um, on display in the wheat field, that's a recreation. Um, but this is kind of when he really starts to um, have some more challenges. And then he ends up, there's a scene where he has a gun um, and it 
some some a little bit debate on how Vincent died. Some most people, including the Van Gogh Museum, think that he died by suicide. There are a few people that think that perhaps he was accidentally shot. And so the films that we're going to be showing tomorrow and the next night at Eternity's Gate and Loving Vincent, it's a little bit controversial. They went with the he um, did not die by suicide. He died by an accidental gunshot wound that was caused by someone else. Um, but that's a little bit controversial. I don't have an opinion one way or the other. People frequently ask me what I think, and I don't I don't have an opinion. Either, either one of those scenarios seems plausible to me. Um, to me, the main thing is the fact that he died at a very young age at 37. And so he's buried in this town of Arles, which is north of Paris. That's his grave marker on the left, and his brother Theo is buried alongside of him on the right. So Vincent van Gogh, born in 1853, died in 1890 at the age of 37. It's amazing to think what could have happened artistically had he lived longer, like what kind of cool artwork would he have created if he had lived to be 50 or 60 or uh, something like that, but we'll never know. So things to look for, did you like the film when we end up streaming it and what did you end up learning from it? So I'm gonna go ahead and stream it in just a minute. Um, just as a reminder, we have the Attorney's Gate uh, film. We're gonna be streaming tomorrow at two different times, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. Well, at least if you're, if you're on the, if you're familiar, in Washington DC time, we're streaming the film tomorrow at 1 p.m. Washington DC time and 7 p.m. Washington DC time. Might be a little bit different because we have a lot of people joining us from other places. And then on Wednesday, uh, we're doing Loving Vincent. So again, just kind of a recap of my opinion of the film. And I'd really be curious to see after you watch it, you know, what do you think about it? Um, so again, the, the positives for me was it provides a broad overview of Vincent's life, really provides a lot of good insight into his early painting career before he moved to France. And then these really dramatic acting performances were excellent. Um, some of the things that I concerned with was just, wish it was a little bit less on the, I wish the first half of the film was only like say 30 minutes, um, but suffice to say that is what it is. Um, and then it was a little bit too much emphasis, I thought, on his mental health. I wish they would have kind of given you more of a portrayal of how intellectual Vincent was. He spent a lot of time reading books and studying other artists and this and that. And you do get a sense of that here and there, but I could have, I thought they could have maybe um, focused a little bit on it more. And then overall, I recommend the film. So let's do this. It's going to take me a minute or two to stream the film. Um, so if you want to watch the film on your own, I included the links that, where you can get it on like Amazon or YouTube in the same place that I had the Zoom instruction. So if you want to go check it out at some point in time, you are free to do so. If you want to stick around and watch it with us, you're more than welcome to. However, if you're watching on Facebook, I can't stream the film on Facebook for you um, because I don't own the copyrights to it. So let me stop. So for those of you watching on Facebook, thanks for joining us. Um, if you wanna watch the film, you can do so on your own at some point in time, just look it up on Amazon or YouTube or Hulu or whatever. But if you're watching on Facebook, I have to disconnect the program because I can't stream this film on Facebook because I don't own the rights to it, but I can stream it through Zoom. So if you ever wanna check out our film programs, make sure you sign up through Eventbrite or Meetup so that you can get the Zoom connection. So hold on for one second, I have to...